talking here this afternoon for what I consider a very important uh, round table at a very sad and tragic moment. Uh, um, um, we have about 250 plus people online and all of you here in the room. Uh, I'm Jan Melissen. Um, Wijnhaven is my academic home and it is great that we have people here from different faculties from all over the university and uh, above all also our uh, rector, uh, uh, Rector Magnificus Hester Bell and I gladly hand over to Hester now for a few words of welcome. Thank you very much Jan. I want to welcome you all to this meeting today. A week ago, on the 24th of February 2022, war started in Ukraine. It was just a week ago, but it already feels like a very long time. And it feels ominous. It brings with it tremendous devastation, losses, suffering, worries, anxiety, and questions. Most of this is happening in Ukraine itself, of course, in the region and the countries that are involved. But this situation touches the whole world, including our community here at Leiden University. This is why we are coming together here today. I warmly welcome each and every one of you present here in the hall at our campus The Hague, as well as those who are following the meeting online. It is so good to come together, to have this conflict explained in scientific terms, to look for answers, and as a community think about what we can do, but especially to listen to one another to talk with and support one another. I would like to particularly welcome our students, staff and guests who have a personal connection, connection with Ukraine and the region, and those who are affected directly or indirectly by the tragic events. We want you to know that we stand in solidarity with you and that we will give you all the support we can. Although we realize that we cannot take away all your concerns and suffering, we are here for you and want to do whatever we can to help you. You will have the opportunity later this afternoon to ask for any help you may need. I will say more about this shortly. I would also like to welcome the researchers who will be taking their place or who took their place on this platform this afternoon. We are very grateful that you were prepared at such short notice to be present here today and to use your expertise to shed some light on this terrible conflict. Particularly when facing such a complex problem, it is an enormous benefit to have scientists from different fields and faculties who are able to discuss and examine the issues that this conflict gives rise to. This fits with our role of providing insights, of interpreting information and engaging with society. Crucial to us are international collaboration, our commitments to open science and open education, and our core value of, ac of academic freedom. We are very concerned that these principles will also come under threat in this conflict. We have many questions and concerns about the people in Ukraine, about the conflict itself and about its background and possible solutions, as well as about the consequences for international relations. We are looking for answers to such questions as how can Putin be stopped? What role is Europe playing? These and many more issues will be addressed by the speakers this afternoon, led by Jan Melissen. For me, this meeting is also an expression of our university's core values. These values, freedom, responsibility, connection and innovation, are not things we take lightly. 
We want to propagate them actively and in practical terms. This also explains why we have come together today. And it is no coincidence that we are here at our campus The Hague, in the city of peace, justice and security. The city where we as university work together with and contribute to politics, administration, policy and international law and organizations. We are connected both with the city and with one another. We want to, and indeed we can, talk to one another here in complete freedom and share our opinions, perspectives and concerns with one another openly. In doing so, we accept the responsibility to listen to and respect one another, to show understanding not only for people from Ukraine who suffer under the attack, but also those from Russia, many of whom are opposed to the war and are themselves suffering its consequences. <laughs> it is also our responsibility to show respect and understanding for what may be very different individual views of this conflict. As well as researchers, there's also staff here this afternoon to support students and staff with advice and practical assistance. We appreciate that besides questions about the conflict itself, students and staff also might have many questions about issues that affect them personally. Questions such as, can I still access my bank account? What will happen with my residence permit if I can't or don't want to go back? Can I still travel to the region for my studies or research? Can I continue to cooperate with colleagues from the region or is that no longer possible? Concerns about family, finances and the future. After the discussion part of today's meeting, please take the opportunity to discuss your questions and concerns with the staff of Student Support Services, the Service Center for International Staff, and the Diversity and Inclusion Expertise Office, as well as with us and with one another. This meeting is an excellent initiative, and I want to thank the organizers, Kuhn Kaminada, Leo Harskamp, Victor Koppelmans, and all those people who managed to arrange this afternoon in such a short time. But we are doing much more than this. There's also the reception of refugee students by the meeting point and inclusion. And I know that many other initiatives are also be being taken up by colleagues and students, such as the Sign for Ukraine, Science for Ukraine website that offers support, meetings at faculties, and the collection of goods that students here at Wijnhaven are organizing. It is heartwarming to see all these initiatives taking place. Are there other things we could do? If you have any other wishes or ideas, we would like to hear from you. Let your study advisor know, or your supervisor, mail your faculty board, or send me a mail. I would like to close with a quote from the famous speech that Professor Kleveringa gave during the Second World War about what binds us together in times of crisis and violence. I sense that the same thoughts and feelings are being communicated back and forth between us without the need for words, yet completely and precisely understood by all of us. I hope that we can share our thoughts and feelings during this meeting this afternoon and in the coming period, and that we can continue to show solidarity with one another and give one another all the support that is needed. And I hope this can be a beginning of further exchanges, meeting and support. I would now like to hand over to Jan Melissen for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hester Bell. Thank you, Hester, for speaking from the heart uh, with very well chosen words, speaking on behalf of the whole university and, and uh, set out, explain uh, the many different sides to, to this meeting which is not just researchers speaking, but many different elements to it. As 
a round table. Uh, uh, before introducing our speakers uh, this afternoon, I would like to make three very brief points about the, the, the nature of the round table. Uh, the round table was announced as the university interpretation on the war in Ukraine. Uh, as the rector has already mentioned, we are of course blessed that we have a diversity of views and a diversity of experts at our university. There is not <coughs> one university view, there is one university solidarity uh, with the victims of these atrocities, but we have a diversity of views at our university, realizing that in many countries that is not the case. As soon as it becomes political, as you know, the academic is supposed to support explain, justify, and analyze government policy and stand behind that. Uh, uh, here uh, we have a diversity of views, which I think is something very important to cherish and to remember today that that is what, what we have here. Um, secondly, uh, we all wake up and go to sleep with the news. And when we wake up in the middle of the night, I'm sure that some of us also watch the news, unfortunately. Uh, uh, and I would like to, to hear, to emphasize that perhaps the, 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 the good thing about the university is that the panel looks behind the headlines. There is not a group of editors that decides what is in the news. No, in our university, researchers have their own agendas. They have their own uh, research agendas. It's their intellectual curiosity their years-long research that informs this debate. So for many people on the panel, the Ukraine did not come on their radar eight days ago, or um, did not come on, on their radar in 2014, or in 2008, or in 2004. So the, the views here, uh, uh, we hear a lot of opinion and see a lot of, an, of opinion in the media. I appreciate very much that these uh, uh, views today uh, are informed uh, by, by research. Also, when we think about policy options, also when we do the very difficult thing, and that is try to look forward. And I will ask the panelists uh, to try and look forward. Also very important of our role as academics and as the university is that we communicate, as Hester said, with society at large. Uh, there is a word for that, science communication. Uh, so to explain our understanding and analysis to a broad audience in words that are not only understood by a very small citation community of scholars, but that can be understood by, in principle, everybody. So I would also like to ask uh, the panel today uh, to bear that in mind. Third point I would like to make, and the final point, is that I think we realize too little what a unique institution the university is in the sense that we have an intergenerational exchange of ideas, that we have an ongoing process of intergenerational learning where we, I hope, teach, mentor, coach, even inspire you at times, but that is a bi-directional process. It's a two-way street where we experience very much the same and the input from the, uh, the next generations is, is absolutely important. Once again, there are few institutions in society where professionals and pre-professionals have that joint, uh, joint platform. Um, so, um, with that, I'm in fact also asking our panelists to be brief today so that we have indeed the space for you in, in the last three quarters of an hour uh, to join this, this debate. Um, I'm going to very briefly uh, uh, um, uh, introduce our speakers right at the end, uh, Antoinette Dimitrova uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the Institute for Security and Global Affairs in the faculty FTGA. Uh, next to that, if I'm right, is sitting Honorata, assistant professor at ISCA, also in, uh, here at, at uh, Weinhaven. Uh, then Veronika Yefremova uh, is from the law faculty, PhD fellow. Uh, Otto Bulle is a senior lecturer in the humanities, uh, faculty of humanities, with expertise on contemporary Russian literature and uh, cinema. Uh, Isabel Duiverstein uh, is professor at the, uh, at the, uh, the History uh, Institute of History uh, and has ex expertise on strategic studies and war studies, which is the field of expertise also of uh, Franz Ozinga, uh, who is also with us uh, here at, at ISGA, but it also uh, has a senior position at the Netherlands Defense Academy. 
Um, so, uh, after these very brief introductions, I would like to uh, give the floor first, and the, the panelists will stay at, at the, the, the table where they are seated now, uh, to uh, Veronica uh, to share with us a perspective on Ukraine, the identity and the reading of history of Ukraine. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Veronica. Uh, I am a PhD fellow at the law faculty, but today I am speaking to you as a Ukrainian. Um, as, as a way of picturing where Ukraine is, because I think it was very nice to see, uh, to hear just now, um, that it, it is true that a lot of people have heard about Ukraine, who, have, who know that it is in Europe, uh, but many uh, people have never visited it. So just as a way of picturing how close it actually is, if you take a trip from Leiden to Rome by car, it is pretty much exactly the same distance as you take a trip from Leiden to Kyiv. Just for you to have that picture in mind. Um, I am a Ukrainian. I have lived in, in the Netherlands for quite some time. And I'm here to talk about a, a personal uh, experience of this um, and to, to talk, to touch upon history and identity because Ukrainian history and identity is very, very rich. Um, first thing, and I'm sure that a lot of you have seen Putin's speech uh, on history and the fact that he claims that Lenin created Ukraine um, and this is why he does not recognize it as, as a country, uh, as a nation of its own, um, and this is why he wants to, uh, to basically have it, because it, is, it should be under, uh, under the Russian regime. Now, if I look back to, to, to history of my country, uh, there's a lot of uh, history coming from medieval times, uh, but I think for, for the purposes of the war, uh, it is important to start off with the Kyiv's Rus. It is important to note that Kyiv has been a city for much longer than Moscow has. Moscow was purely a village when Kyiv was already a city. Um, Kyiv has played a fundamental role in uh, the formation of the Soviet Union. It played a, a tremendous role in, uh, with the Austrian, uh, with uh, the Germans in World War II. And it was a very dangerous place to be because that was always the center of freedom of thought and identity. And this is where the identity comes from, I think, for, for all Ukrainians. And I have lived abroad for, for many years, but I feel as Ukrainian as anyone really. Um, and it's something part of our roots, let's say. Um, if you look at our coat of arms, there is actually, interestingly, a word hidden in there, which is vola, and it means freedom. And this is why we as a nation have been fighting for freedom for many, many centuries now. It came from Kievska Rus, then we had the Soviet Union, then with the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, Gorbachev uh, made, it was, it was a decision that, and he recognized the fact that Russia and Ukraine are different. Yes, we speak one language, most of us do. Uh, I, I speak Russian. Uh, actually, my surname is Russian uh, because I have family there. Uh, I'm purely Ukrainian, but my surname is Russian because I have ancestry there, just like I have ancestry from Poland. I mean, this is how the Eastern Bloc functions. Uh, but that does not mean that we are not a democratic nation and that we're not a society. Um, so this identity very much stems from the, the 18th, 19th century of, of wanting freedom and fighting for freedom because we as Ukrainians have never really uh, been able to actually come under a regime where freedom of thought and freedom of expression was, was not allowed. And you see that through history of both uh, the Soviet Union and after. Um, and for, for the European community, for the world community, that very much came 
on the radar, I think, in 2004 with the Orange Revolution, where the Ukrainian people stood out uh, in a revolt because we, ha we did not have democratic elections. So that was when you saw it on the international arena that we as the people want that. Um, I'm going to close off with one thing. Um, it's the fact, that what I said with the interconnectedness, and yes, we speak Russian, we have our similarities, but that does not mean that we are not a country of our own. Um, yes, I have friends from Russia, and now we are put in a very difficult position, especially, I mean, all my friends and family uh, are saying that they will never forgive uh, what Russia is doing. And I don't think any of us will because there is currently bombing in my city of Kyiv and my parents and family are in shelter for four days. So it's understandable. Um, but for example, the Ukrainian diaspora, we meet each other and you see still the commonalities and it creates a very strange atmosphere because we do not know how to act. Um, and so this is something that we will see in the future of how Russians and Ukrainians are going to get past this because this is pain that is going to last generations. And unfortunately, I still remember quite well when I was a kid when the two nations were friends uh, and we had friendly stories. And unfortunately now the only stories that we can tell are the fact that our cities are being bombed uh, and that we are, our, our, our country is trying to be taken away from us for not a lot of reason, no reason at all actually. Um, and our democracy and the democracy of Europe really uh, is under threat. I think I will leave it at that, Jan. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica. Um... Great to have you on the panel, which is totally obvious. Uh, and the point that you make about interconnectedness between that you personify with your surname, with your Russian surname, and as an international Ukrainian woman who spent more of her life outside of the Ukraine, inside the Ukraine. Uh, um, but you mentioned the, the, uh, and underlined the interconnectedness between the Russian people and the Ukrainian people. Now, could we fast forward that? That is not going to disappear. And could you comment on how you see that looking forward rather than backward? Unfortunately, I think that it is, go it is not going to turn out well. Um, I think that both nations, even with the, the similarities, they are, there is no common ground, mutual ground for respect and acceptance at the moment, just because, um, Russian people, well, the, the, the Russian Federation has made such a drastic attack on Ukraine and on the Ukrainian identity. Um, and I know that families are now being torn apart because the, the, the Russian side of the family is no longer speaking to Ukraine, the Ukrainian side. But I also know uh, stories where Russian people are saying, hey, what, what are you doing? My, my parents live uh, in Kiev. Why are you bombing the city where my parents live? Um, I think it's a very, very dispersed picture. And, but I, I know also from personal feeling that it will take a very long time for that respect and inter, that friendly interconnectedness um, to flourish again, because at the moment it is, it is not there anymore. Thank you. Yes, the, um, you mentioned the diaspora. We have never been as aware worldwide of the huge Ukrainian diaspora everywhere. Um, is there anything you would like to highlight about the role that you see that, that diaspora play? I, th I think it's, a, it's, it's one of the, the things that keeps us all going, that diaspora. And for example, for me, it's very difficult seeing my family and my friends uh, suffer and me not being able to do anything. But it's very nice to have the diaspora here and we're all going through the same thing. And the Ukrainian 
uh, community and I guess the people of Ukraine have this very nice trait that when things get very, very bad and it comes from our, our, our urge to fight for freedom, that we are so collective, we work together, we help each other out so, so much uh, because we know that that is the only way to get through it and to fight evil, to, to fight the attacks that go on. So I think that you will see it more and more, um, and it's always very nice to, to have that home feeling, because Ukrainians, I think, they love their country so much that they take it wherever they go. At least I have for, 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 for my whole life, even though I live in the Netherlands. Thank you so much, Veronica, and I'm sure we will get back to you later in the uh, Q&A. Uh, next is uh, Honorata Masipus, uh, and Honorata uh, um, is from, originally from Poland, has done a lot of research also on Ukraine, it's been in Ukraine doing field research, uh, and I believe also with Antoinette sitting, sitting uh, next to her, uh, and has recently uh, been engaged in a project on uh, disinformation, fake news, uh, is also very interested in the role of civil society, and that's where we start this panel with the people. So, uh, Onrata, over to you. Thank you so much, Jan, and thank you, Veronica. I think it's a really nice follow-up that I have now uh, after your words. And uh, I would like to talk to you about two of the themes that I have researched in Ukraine and in Russia, actually. I have done also a lot of work uh, in Russia. I've lived there also for a while. Uh, I want to talk about civil society and misinformation, and I'll approach this somewhat differently than my usual academic interventions. I will start with a rather personal reflection that turned out very significant for the interpretation of my findings and for putting them into perspective. I will also include the voices and additions of my two Ukrainian colleagues and co-authors who are not here with us today, uh, Nina Onoprichuk and Oleksandra Keudel. It's really important for me that uh, um, I get it right, so I also support myself with the text, so please forgive me that um, it, yeah, I will be sometimes reading of the paper. Um, so when I moved to Poznan in my home country, Poland, to study, just like many of you have moved to study here, um, to study Eastern studies, in Poland it means uh, everything to the east from Poland uh, that used to be post-Soviet, that used to be Soviet Union. Um, one of the early formative experiences that I had as a student was the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. With a group of students from my institute, we joined the demonstrations in support of Ukrainians asking for the recount of the votes in the presidential elections. 2004, remember? This was the winter of 2004, the same year Poland has joined the EU, and Polish authorities said we are joining and we are not closing the door behind us. So the Orange Revolution was the second time that year, after uh, joining of Poland of the EU, that I experienced that collective action can succeed in the name of democratic principles. Here, this was the fight for free and fair elections. This was also the moment where the paths in the development of state-society relations in Ukraine and Russia diverged. Um, probably for the first time actually since the collapse of the Soviet Union so drastically. Ukrainians proved that they care about having the voice, their voice heard, they exercised their freedom of speech, started building civil society and free media, and more broadly showed that they are keeping an eye on their leaders, they are keeping their leaders in check. In Russia, the fear of what was called the orange virus back then dominated the minds of the leadership the media, and the public space since then. The pseudo-civil society was set up by the state. Civil society, by definition, should be separate from the state. Perhaps some of, them remember, some of, some of you remember organizations such as NASHI, an incorporation of independent organizations into the state. Political competition was restrained, freedom of media halted, and the tradition of labeling opposition to Putin's regime, fascists or Nazis, began then. After Putin waited out the 2012-2013 wave of protests and increased repression, especially linked to anti-corruption movements, for example, led by Navalny, the checks from citizens on his power were virtu virtually eliminated. This is why Ukraine became a thorn in Putin's side. The citizens of Ukraine with smaller and larger successes were building politically engaged society, paving the path towards democracy, showing that it is possible, also in this region. These parallel and opposite developments of state-society relations 
accumulated in Euromaidan revolution in 2014, when Ukrainian citizens stood up to object the decision of President Yanukovych not to sign the association agreement with Europe. The change of power happened, the association agreement was signed, and the Ukrainian people once again showed that their collective action matters. They paid a high price for this then, some with their lives, and the country by angering the dictator who annexed a part of the territory and attacked, attacked another. But since then, the development of the society and institutions was, was moving forward even more vibrantly. Um, although the move towards an open society is not a linear process, my earlier research showed that young Ukrainians deeply care about having authorities that are transparent, not corrupt, elected in free and competitive elections, and show, and who show integrity. The research we conducted uh, in our large project on Eastern Partnership countries with Antoinetta and with the two colleagues I mentioned, Nina Onoprichuk and Alexander Kaudal, showed that diverse organizations were created to facilitate the communication between political authorities, experts, and citizens to promote citizens' rights and the rule of law, and to aid monitoring of the authorities. Organizations and initiatives um, active in the sphere were mostly linked to the European Union, in, and in our analysis promoted a change of the status, status quo and pushed for further opening of the socio-political system. As Alexandra pointed out, organizations have been created in the aftermath of the Orange Revolution, for example, civil network Opora, correct me if I'm pronouncing it wrong, and social movements such as Chesna, which means honesty. honesty. Even more united collective action after the Euromaidan was created through reanimation package of uh, reform, a coalition of citizens that united experts and NGOs across virtually any policy area. These are just a few names of organizations. There are really, really a lot of them. When looking at the bravery of the Ukrainian citizens right now, one cannot miss the collective spirit driving their actions, the networks, common projects, know-how, and human capital that they have created over the years shows in how they handle the crisis at the moment. And here I will turn to the personal story again. I am also very proud of the civil society mobilization in Poland to help Ukrainians. The response is great. The networks and organizations built over the years help in getting those who can offer help in touch with those who need it. And creativity in finding ways to help show deep, deep commitment to the cause. So on both sides, you see, of the border, the civil society is crucial. The people are crucial. And now very briefly, I know that I am running out of time, Jan. I will touch upon the second issue, the misinformation. There are two things about this that I would like to say on the basis of our research with colleagues uh, from Orus, but also from our project with Antoinetta. Conflict perceptions increase the belief in the spread, in, in the sp the belief and the spread of fake news on, the, on both sides of the conflict. The humanization of the enemy needs to be avoided. That's a path towards more violence. In such a highly misinformation-prone environment, having channels that provide clear and reliable information is crucial in both Ukraine and Russia. While sanctions are important in pressuring the aggressor to stop and making Russians question their leadership and the war more, Cutting Russians off from the information and eliminating their information channels from Europe does not seem to be a desirable path. For Russia, it means no access to alternative information sources. It's not just about watching YouTube videos. It is about the information about the war for those who seek knowledge beyond the state propaganda. They are the only ones who can pass it on within their country and they need to have access to it. As Nina, my other colleague, pointed out, Ukrainians are now using any possible channel to make the Russians seek the truth, to be critical of the propaganda, begging mothers to stop their kids from going to this war, trying to show their relatives, friends, as uh, uh, Veronica said, we are all interconnected, contacts, what is really going on and what is the cost everyone is paying. As for banning Russian media sources in Europe, it seems unnecessary and might be counterproductive. In the freedom of the European media, media space, Sputnik and RT are not real threats. Banning those channels, however, as one of um, our co-authors also uh, pointed out, might actually polarize some groups and amplify conspiracy theories. 
The best way to counter the mis misinformation now is to tell and show the truth, just like the Ukrainians are doing by allowing the captured Russian soldiers to call their mothers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorata. I have to live up to the commit my commitment to the students that there will be really time to talk. So I have only one question for you. It's a very simple one. We've uh, heard, but the question is simple. The answer may be more challenging. Uh, you've also uh, read the news and seen the news that uh, Russia Today and Sputnik uh, are going to be closed down, are closed down effectively. Um, what the kind of reaction did that trigger with you, who feels that we should not shut down communication but keep lines open? Yes, I, I don't believe that Sputnik or RT can overwhelm our public opinion in Europe. We have freedom of speech, we have freedom of media, and uh, the information is reaching people because we see it. We see it here in the room, we see it in public mobilization, we see it in public opinion. Um, there has not been such a strong mobilization for any country, I think, as far as I remember, as now is for Ukraine. So this is not a danger to us. The danger is that those conspiracy theorists who are within Europe will have a reason to say, look, you are shutting down freedom of speech and this is against your values. Something is wrong. And we don't want them to have that weapon, right? So I think this is, this is the reasoning. And you see already the reaction on the Russian side. They are pressing Eko Moskva. They actually shut down the Eko Moskva. Last channels of communication, uh, of, of information, such as Dosh TV, which is the, TV, the online TV that perhaps you've heard of, um, that is the only opposition TV functioning in Russia. So even without our actions, they are already suppressing access to information. <coughs> we should not, not participate in that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Honorata. Uh, when, when I mentioned in my introduction that uh, um, the, the beauty of, of uh, discussing this at the university is that we also look at issues behind the headlines, I had Otto Bulle very much in mind and his interest uh, in uh, contemporary Russian literature and cinema. And you in, uh, told me that you would also like to reflect a little on the role of the church at the highest and lower levels. So over to you. Thank you, Jan. Um, Yes, there are two main issues that I would like to uh, address here. Um, I'm refocusing a little on the Russian side. So what is happening in Russia and what will the consequences be of uh, the, the sanctions um, uh, for the arts, I mean, the, the sector that is uh, dearest to my heart, at least. Um, I'll start with the church, though. Um, it's, uh, it, it's obvious that most of the attention goes to the military, the geopolitical aspects of, uh, of the war. Um, and it's, uh, but it's strange to see that the church seems to be uh, completely silent on this, um, on this issue. Um, it's not really surprising considering the lack of autonomy, lack of independence of Patriarch Kirill, who's very supportive of, uh, of Putin. So maybe it's not surprising, um, but it's still something that we should uh, reflect on. Uh, that this potential opposing voice uh, remains silent. Um, Patriarch Kirill, if you go to the website, you, you will barely see a reference to uh, what's going on in, uh, in Ukraine right now. Uh, but he did mention uh, the war, uh, not referring to it as such, of course, uh, in his sermon last Sunday. Um, and uh, it's... It's, it's really um, unsettling to see how much of a sermon is simply a copy-paste operation from the Putin speeches that we've heard over the last uh, weeks and, and months. Um, so he also drives home the point that Ukraine, Russia, Belarus are basically one entity and that uh, you know, he will pray for the unity of the Slavic lands. He refers to the primary chronicle, saying that you know, this is how it was meant to be. Um, and that is really very uh, un unsettling to see. Um, interestingly, he, he promised to, uh, he called on his par par parishioners to pray for a metropolitan Anufri, who is the head of the Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church. Now, there are now two Orthodox churches in, in uh, Ukraine, one that has become independent uh, and is no longer under the jurisdiction of uh, the uh, Moscow Patriarch, 
uh, patriarchate. Um, and there, then there's the other one, uh, which still obeys to Moscow. Um, and um, Patriarch Kirill said he would pray for Anufri, the, the, the obedient one, so to speak. Uh, but interestingly, uh, Metropolitan Anufri has uh, very much condemned Russian violence. So this is an interesting twist of events that, um, you know, the, 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 the highest church authority that Moscow was supposed to rely upon is suddenly uh, raising its voice and uh, uh, not being ob obedient anymore. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how this plays out. Now, um, Patriarch Kirill, as I said, is a very uh, obedient man, obedient towards uh, Putin, but some uh, individual priests are, are no longer accepting this. So um, Medusa, one of the um, independent media resources um, that I rely on, and, and many with me, I guess, uh, published an open letter of over 200 individual priests uh, condemning violence and uh, uh, really um, calling on Putin to, uh, to stop the war. So um, I don't think it will really change events, but uh, it, it, it's an illustration of the fact that even uh, in this part of social life where, where we, where, that we hear a little very, very little about, um, some people are really, um, uh, you know, no longer accepting what is, what is happening here. Now, um, I have one minute left to reflect on art. I will um, then just confine myself to um, what will happen to um, probably the, the most expensive art form uh, that exists, which is cinema. Uh, I'm a, more or less a specialist on Russian cinema, and it's obvious that the um, that the sanctions will have a devastating effect on cinema production in, uh, in, in Russia. Uh, Warner Bros. Disney have announced that their films would no longer be shown in Russia, meaning that the revenues uh, will drop dramatically. Um, and that is an important source for financing Russian film productions. Um, uh, Sergei Laznitsa, um, and this is uh, something that I will uh, will end with, um, has called upon the Urine uh, Film Academy um, to take a strong position and condemn Putin's violence, which it then did, uh, excluding all Russian directors from participating in the European film uh, festivals. Now, and that was something that Lasnitsa did not accept because he said, well, because someone has a Russian passport, you should not ban him from participating in these international events. And, and I think that's, a, um, this kind of brings us back to the issue of Sputnik, um, should we close off all channels? I think it, it, it's, um, it, it, it's counterproductive to uh, ban individual artists, individual directors, from participating in European events uh, just because that uh, is in consonance with uh, the uh, sanctions policy of the European Union. Um, so, yeah, I guess I've already run out of time, so I'll leave it at that. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, I only wish I could give you more time, Otto, because it's really fascinating. As you say, aspects of social life, of life, uh, spiritual life, uh, that we hear and read little about, uh, but that are religion also very important for people in times uh, like, like these. And uh, the role of the cultural sector. Um, I'm, again, uh, trying to, to save time. I would like to ask question, one question to you. Uh, but give you a choice out of two. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the first then is what do you think would be the long-term consequences of the international ostracism of the, the Russian cultural sector? Or um, we have often seen that artists and intelligentsia find new ways of expressing, imaginative ways of expressing their protest. Um, so what does that make you uh, think about? So either of these two questions, what you feel most comfortable with? Yes, perhaps I'm, I'm painting too bleak uh, a perspective of what will happen to the film industry. Uh, obviously, with, with new media, um, I'm, I'm sure documentary makers will find uh, ways of 
uh, recording of of, um, um, of of making new films, but obviously it will not be of the of the standard, uh, financially speaking, of what would have been possible under normal circumstances. It's obvious that the state will uh, start reconsidering its priorities and that uh, less money will go to the film industry. Um, let's hope that um, Russian filmmakers uh, will be creative in finding new ways of, uh, of getting their message across. That's all I can say. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Otto. Uh, then we move to a sort of forward to sort of an not really an intermezzo, but a slightly different format uh, where Franz Osicha is going to talk about the, the origins of the, the present war, uh, uh, making sense of what is going right on right now. And as I asked him to do, also to look forward, because we are interested in... I've been walking around with a heavy heart since the start of this war, and hence the title of this opening slide. Uh, this is a tragedy for the Ukraine, but it's much bigger than only the Ukraine. This affects us all, and I think all of us are fully aware of that. Um, I will try to address a couple of questions in about 15 minutes, and just for your entertainment, I've included a couple of uh, pictures uh, in my slides. First of all, uh, the tragedy is, is shouldn't have come as a surprise. We have been suffering from some strategic inertia because after the annexation of the Crimea in 2014, we had become fully aware of Putin's agenda, the messianic mission that he has to unify all the Russian-speaking people into a Russian empire that looks a bit like the Tsarist empire of the 19th century. And he doesn't shy away from using military violence and intimidation or what we call these days hybrid influence operations, just like the, the poisoning of uh, the Skripal in the, in the UK, for instance. We have witnessed his military modernization that allowed him actually to occupy the Crimea. Uh, NATO has become aware, but we became somewhat reluctant actually to take this very seriously. Although NATO said, listen, we need to spend more on defense just as a response to this uh, uh, aggression. And I've included a couple of pictures here on some open source publications. For instance, um, the somewhat sobering report by the Klingendal Institute and the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. They, re they publish an annual report called a strategic monitor. And this one is titled The Writing on the Wall. And on the left hand side you see a whole series of trends. And everything in red pointing upwards generally is a very ominous sign. So it is here. We see an increasingly assertive, aggressive rhetoric, military buildups, military modernization, increasing in military spending. So um, we saw this coming. And the two titles of the Time magazine and Economist are not from these days. They stem from 2014. And in 2016, the EU published its new security strategy. And it told us that we are living in an existentially threatening time. Our union is under threat. So this shouldn't have come as a surprise. However, it seems that we have made some strategic errors over the past years, but at least the past couple of months. Over the past three decades, we have demonstrated to be very bad at reading the minds of authoritarian leaders, whether it be Milosevic, Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, or now Putin. We've also made life easy for Putin in his strategic consideration by explicitly excluding the risk that we would intervene militarily. We explicitly excluded military assistance to the Ukraine in any form outside of delivery of military equipment. In the middle you see a cover of a book we published last year, or in 2020, an editor's volume on the nature of deterrence. And by excluding that military threat, we removed the uncertainty out of the strategic equation and made it somewhat easier for him to consider going into Ukraine at some point. We were deeply divided all the way up to last week. 
and we needed American leadership once again to unify us. It now seems that the American intelligence has been spot on over the past month in their warnings, and indeed last week they were spot on in their prediction that within that 24 hours the war would start. So, um, we have become somewhat slow in our responses, and that will cost the Ukraine dearly. We, and when it comes to deterrence, Putin has deterred us. We haven't been able to deter Putin. But Putin made his own set of strategic errors. He should have started a couple of weeks earlier, when we were still divided from a strategic perspective. I'm glad he didn't. But it afforded the West and the Ukraine time to get prepared and to become unified. He has dramatically underestimated the speed of our policy changes and our unification in the West and in Europe in particular. Once it became, became apparent that the invasion, the invasion was indeed afoot. And this has resulted in an unprecedented set of sanctions and a complete political, cultural, financial isolation of Putin. Whether that actually will change his policy, that is up for grabs. I really doubt it. Generally, if you want to apply sanctions, the deterrent effect generally occurs prior to applying sanctions. And once the sanctions have been applied, it becomes just a strategic fact that that regime will just take into account. And the effects of sanctions will accumulate only very slowly. However, it has become a very important signal that we have been able to find the unity to apply those sanctions. Putin also made a somewhat strange error in the gamble of going to Kiev on day one with his air mobile forces, hoping for a blitzkrieg, a welcoming by the Ukrainian public, and a easy march into Kiev and occupy the governmental centers and thereby toppling the Zelensky regime. That gamble really failed dramatically. He overestimated his own military capabilities and he vastly underestimated the resilience and the defensive capabilities of the Ukrainian military and its society. At the operational level, at the tactical level, this is the images that we see on television every day. Uh, as a, from a, coming from a military background, uh, we have been really surprised about the lack of coordination between air and ground the lack of coordination between artillery, infantry, and cavalry, which explains somewhat the heavy casualties that Russia is in, uh, incurring right now. Uh, they are not exploiting air superiority as the West would do from day one, which would make it life much easier for the Russian ground troops. And this somewhat explains the slow ground uh, advance. Another aspect, everybody has been talking about the risk of cyber warfare. So far, cyber warfare seems to have had a very limited effect on events on the ground. And the Russians, amazingly, have lost the information war. And that can be credited to Zelensky and his people. The operational outlook. Now let's, let's look forward uh, a bit. We are still witnessing a, a forefront war. Things go actually quite well for Putin in the south and somewhat in the east. We expect he can actually connect the southern part to the Donbas region and expand his influence on the Donbas. Western military equipment that we provide is crucial. However, that is really limited for closing defense purposes. So anti-tank weapons are wonderful stuff, but you need to get in with two kilometers of the tank. Same applies to the anti-aircraft missiles. So that is wonderful, but it doesn't help you anything with uh, trying to interdict the convoy 60 miles away from Kiev. The lack of Ukrainian air power allows the Russians to slowly mass forces and surround the cities at some point and the fear is now, in most analytical uh, circles, that we will see uh, the surrounding of cities, the beleaguerments and the sieges of cities, and Grozny-like, um, well, massacres, actually. So that's a pretty, pretty bloody and prolonged fight, uh, which will cause massive military and civilian casualties. We hope that that, that perspective will actually not materialize, but that is the fear in most analytical circles right now. It is unclear what Putin actually desires. We know he wants to prevent the Ukraine becoming a member of the EU and NATO, but we don't know exactly when he considers that uh, objective to be achieved. He might consider uh, an objective to 
completely occupy the Ukraine. And he could do that. He does have the forces to completely obliterate, in the end, all military uh, uh, defense forces of the Ukraine. However, his forces are not enough to actually occupy and stabilize the Ukraine. And in particular, when he has to fear a guerrilla war, uh, that those 150,000 troops are not nearly enough. Um, so he may settle for somewhat something in between. Uh, he may actually claim a limited, limited success as a victory and stop the war. Right now, he could actually stop the war and claim victory because right now, Kiev, of course, doesn't control the entirety of Ukraine. And right now, there is no chance whatsoever that NATO in the future will accept Ukraine as a new member. So in, from that perspective, right, Putin stands to, war, stands to win this war if he wants a limited victory. From a geopolitical outlook, this has been a complete shock to the European security architecture, much like, but even worse, in 2014. It is a dramatic reset, or it will force a dramatic reset of Western security and defense policies, and we've seen what happened in Germany. Right? And a dramatic increase in defense spending all the way up to 100 billion euro. And perhaps in Europe, that is the most dramatic illustration of our change in mindset that occurred within one week. We are probably seeing the emergence of a new Cold War. I've been educated and raised and have, as a pilot, F-16 pilot. I've been trained during the Cold War. But the Cold War was stable. All parties were interested in maintaining a status quo equilibrium stability. We had codes of conduct. We knew how to behave and how to avoid escalating a, a crisis. Not anymore. Here we have a regime in Moscow that seems to be willing to actually challenge the existing status quo. That is the agenda. Hence the title, New Cold War, but much more unstable. NATO and the West, however, have now got a new lease of life. Remember, Macron said NATO was brain dead. Under Trump, the, the existence and the, the viability and the utility of NATO was actually quite uh, substantially being uh, challenged by Trump itself. Right? What, what should have been the bedrocks of our democratic societies in the West. It now seems we have found a new purpose of life and a new sense of unity. We need to readdress, from a military perspective, our deterrence strategies. Our deterrence strategies, as one of the official uh, advisory bodies in the Netherlands uh, concluded a couple of years ago, currently can only punish Moscow after the fact. We cannot, right now, defend the Eastern European countries, as one American study also concluded. Article 5 cannot be guaranteed right now. So we need to change our deterrence process to be able to actually defend those territories and also to communicate to Moscow that he simply will never succeed in his new aggression towards, for instance, the Baltic states. Europe will spend, have to spend more on defense. It will have to become strategically more autonomous and less dependent on American military contributions. Over the past 30 years, we knew we had become addicted to American military contributions. And now that the US also has to pivot to shift its focus to China, because that is, from the American perspective, the real game-changing uh, actor, right? we need to make sure that NATO is also a viable and effective organization without massive US support. And the US needs to believe that we can actually also hold our own in NATO if they need to shift gears towards the Pacific. The question for the Baltics and Poland right now is to what extent we are actually willing when push comes to shove and we see another sort of aggression like we've witnessed in Ukraine, whether we are willing to defend the Baltics, even if Putin manages to threaten us with nuclear weapons. And we know Putin's doctrine when it comes to nuclear strategy differs from ours. Putin, Russia, the Russian military doesn't have a word for deterrence. In Russia, the word for deterrence and compellence are actually quite the same. For them, using nuclear weapons, right, can also be, they can also be used to enforce a new status quo, a new fait accompli. And that is the major concern right now of Poland and the Baltic states. And I will leave it at that.
Thank you very much, uh, Frans. We then move on to Isabella Duivenstein. And I was just thinking of what a, a, um, a colleague of mine in the UK once said. He said, Jan, we only have history and our brains uh, to resort to. Uh, uh, but perhaps there's a little more as well. And that is we, at the university, we'd like to use theory. And theory to open up the debate on how we see things and develop alternative, alternative logics. Uh, um, so uh, I believe that is your uh, mission today, Isabella, to, uh, to enlighten us on, on that side of things. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and the invitation to participate. Indeed, my area of expertise is quite close to my neighbor here, uh, even though I teach in the International Studies Program and I don't uh, practice uh, war studies field presently. Um, before I start, I would like to um, express my sympathy uh, with those who have family and loved ones who are directly affected by the situation in Ukraine. What brings us here today is the struggle that we all experience to comprehend and explain what has happened. And my esteemed colleagues have already offered a lot of food for thought. Um, Indeed, my contribution, uh, as already introduced, is uh, that I want to uh, appeal to, your, um, to the audience, to you as members of the audience, as scholars. And I want to offer you uh, some food for thought about the logic, the logic behind this violence and destruction. And I think there is an important role for the academy in our field of expertise, the fields of war studies, history, uh, social sciences, and political sciences. And in my five minute introduction, I would like to offer you two perspectives or two logics for your consideration. I'm going to borrow here from social theory and the logics are called the logic of consequence and the logic of appropriateness. And I'm going to talk uh, about them in uh, this order. So the logic of consequences echoes very much the story that we've just heard from Professor Ozinga. It focuses on an image of human beings as being driven in their decision-making by rational choices. People weigh options against each other based on costs and benefits. And in this perspective, violence is used to bring goals closer. The goals have been formulated and violence is used to achieve them. And there are indeed several indications, quite a lot of evidence, that this consequential logic is at play on both sides of the divide. The Putin government has stated its aims very publicly and quite clearly. The realization of demilitarization of Ukraine, turning it into a state that is friendly to Moscow, as well as reversing the extension of NATO into the Russophone sphere and addressing Russian security concerns. In the past few months, the Russian Federation has tried coercive diplomacy um, in order to press these aims. It did not lead to the fulfillment of the agenda and now open armed conflict has started with the infringement on the sovereignty of Ukraine. On the side of EU and NATO, the defense of the sovereignty rights of Ukraine have been central in the efforts to deter and uh, force Russia to change its course of action. Diplomacy has been used, now stringent economic sanctions have been instituted, all the while, while the Allies have said, direct military force is not an option on the table. This logic shows shortcomings. So there's things that we cannot explain if we subscribe to this theoretical lens. As I think the Russian government could have envisioned beforehand, the attacks, and here I diverge slightly from my colleague, the attacks themselves have caused the unity among the NATO and the EU allies to grow. So it's not so much the American role, but I think the attack itself has been pivotal in order to understand what has happened and how the discussion has changed fundamentally within NATO and within the EU. Moreover, EU membership discussion for Ukraine has now been given a catalyst. This is far from what Russia wanted. Overall, this is a very common phenomenon, uh, not just in history, but also in sociology and even psychology. Psychologists have got something to say about this, the rally behind the flag effect. So when external pressure is exerted, internal cohesion increases. 
The logic of consequences appears to have allowed very little room for taking on board a living, responding, reacting opponent. So do we take the opponent on board in our planning, in our weighing of specific courses of action? So far, the effect of the use of force has been retrenchment, the raising of the salience of the conflict issue, and the othering of the opponent. Honorata has used the word dehumanizing. So we place the opponent at a distance and don't see the human characteristics as clearly. All factors I've just mentioned complicate any form of clear outcome which is so desired in the quest that we are seeking to either enforce defeat on the opponent and seek victory for ourselves. So the logic of consequences is found wanting. Let's move on to the logic of appropriateness. This is a second logic which tries to make sense of um, events based on social practices in which history, culture, previous experience as well as performance play a role. What is appropriate and what is expected behavior? In this pers perspective, decisions are taken because they are perceived to be right and comply with internalized norms rather than for their instrumental outcome. So people are not weighing costs and benefits against each other as the previous perspective would hold, but instead they focus on the social function. There are several indications that this logic is at play. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the state has lost status and influence in international affairs. This is in stark contrast to the historic role Russia has played over the centuries. And there is a quest to seek recognition as a great power. And the status seeking is not uncommon in international affairs. There are other examples. The problems we are facing with Iran, for example, and China are also partly driven by the status seeking desire. The wish to be recognized is denied or frustrated. On a more personal level, we can also observe that President Putin considers himself a statesman and he is concerned with his role as leader and also his legacy. What has he done for the Russian Federation that will allow him a place in the history books? He has, for instance, and this is a practical translation, he has, for instance, insisted that he wants to deal with President Biden directly rather than through NATO or through the uh, European allies. The United States has also given witness to this logic of appropriateness and signaled Putin's emphasis. They're representing a direct dialogue as a reward for playing by the rules. Moreover, the EU and NATO and their member states operate with the idea that there is a norms-based international order with expected behavior such as a respect for principles of sovereignty, human rights, international humanitarian law. Appropriate behavior is also at the core of the EU answer. We are not focused on killing people, far from it. We use instruments that we deem more acceptable, such as economic sanctions, which as I've already hinted, uh, are not always very, or not very effective overall, and tend to hurt the population more than the people in positions of decision-making. So similar to the first logic, also, when you apply it, we run into limitations. The role and recognition-seeking behavior has, for example, run aground in the UN Security Council and yesterday in the General Assembly of the UN. And there are even questions whether Russia's most significant interlocutor, China, will continue to follow this road of abstention while facing huge international pressure to condemn. Also, the EU has been forced to rethink, rethink its entrenched role and standing practices in international affairs. Will this credibility of the EU, but also of NATO, be further tested? The idea that others might not share your frame of reference and indeed act upon a very different outlook explains part of the shock of the past week. In short, what is appropriate is not always useful. And what is useful is not always appropriate. This is, I think, the conundrum we find ourselves in. 
And a starting point would be for us to understand both these logics, in particular for the party we are opposing. And only in this way can we start to identify common ground. I would like to round off. Leiden University has a lot of expertise to share. Uh, and tomorrow, the Leiden University Center for International Relations will hold another round table in which, in particular, younger scholars uh, will get the floor. Um, it brings together four faculties and seven institutes that um, have expertise in the field of international relations. And the round table will be next door at one o'clock. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. <laughs> Thank you very much also for pointing out that the other round table. And the second round table will not be the last round table. And I think it <laughs> will be very good to have an ongoing, an ongoing dialogue here. Um, thanks also for um, making this comprehensible, uh, uh, um, um, introducing theory in, in for a, a general audience and, and how uh, that is actually a, a useful tool. Uh, but I want to go back with the one question that I have for you, also to save time, no more than one question, um, to the fact that you're a historian, a military historian, and looking at military history, what does military history tell us about the trajectory of war in general, and perhaps this one in particular? Um, I, I, I will struggle to fit this into a very brief answer. Um, uh, there's lots to say about military history, and of course, rich, history is very rich in examples to think through the present situation, and this is one of the things I enjoy doing most with my students. Um, I think it was Angela Merkel who uh, came out uh, and said uh, when she had met Putin that she uh, encountered a 21st century politician with a 19th century frame of mind. That's in a nutshell, I think, what history can offer. We need to look back at the 19th century, uh, a period in history in which we were preoccupied with empire and colonization and territory and controlling populations. Characteristics of warfare in that particular time frame uh, do not bode well for the present, uh, characterized by brute force, battles, sieges, uh, already very uh, aptly demonstrated and illustrated by my colleague. We know that there's a preoccupation with winning, and winning and losing are binaries um, that um, do not appear quite often in recent history. So a clear military victory, um, winning not only the battle, not only the war, but also the peace, is very uncommon. So what we are heading for is a very complex and complicated situation. Um, what I want to give to you in terms of uh, reflections on the field of military history and military studies is that we are um, uh, struggling. Um, and there is a, um, a moment here in time we're experiencing life that um, triggers deeper reflection. Because recent pre preoccupations with cyber war and with hybrid war in particular, when we look back on that, these were all pre pre preludes to conventional warfare. So we are going to be forced to reinterpret all kinds of certainties that we operated from. And also an interesting discussion, uh, I'm going to stop after this, um, interesting discussion uh, in the field that I'm particularly focused on uh, by non-state non actor violence. So we were talking about post-territorial warfare. So war in which territory didn't matter. And this was informed by the practices of Al-Qaeda, a terrorist organization trying to bring together people based on belonging to the family of Islam, regardless of where people lived. That was supposed to be the wave of the future. This is where we needed to be looking. We need to reconsider all those questions and all those lines of inquiry. So lots of work ahead of us for OK, thank you very much, Isabel. And uh, a small question goes a long way with you. Uh, but it's very interesting. It's very interesting uh, what you bring to the table here. Absolutely. So thanks for that. Uh, then we move on to Antoinette uh, Dimitrova, uh, finally, before we go into the, the Q&A. But with her uh, enormous expertise on how the EU is dealing with EU candidate countries, well, we've heard some things in the past few days, haven't we, uh, Antoinette? Yes. Over to you. Yes, indeed. 
Indeed, uh, Jan, we've heard uh, some things about the EU's response to uh, the war uh, in Ukraine. And um, these things are quite going quite further than anyone expected the EU to go. I mean, uh, uh, my colleague Franz Osinger has already said something about it. Uh, but I want to start with Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine did something which I don't believe any candidate for EU membership has ever done. It submitted its official application while being attacked and at war two days ago, President Zelensky signed and sent to the President of the European Parliament, the President of the European Commission, and the French Presidency of the European Council of Ministers, Ukraine's application for EU membership. This is a historic and, of course, also credit to his very good sense of PR. Uh, there was also talk, a very moving speech of Zelensky in front of the European Parliament, and there was also talk about special short procedure for Ukraine becoming an EU member state. Now, as a specialist in EU politics and comparative politics, but also in the procedures that involve enlargement, uh, let me immediately say this is not possible. Um, not because I don't support it personally, but because uh, any kind of uh, joining the European Union is a long process throughout which countries take on board the legislation, the rules and norms of the EU. Uh, we often tend to tell students to illustrate how big they are, that we are talking about 100,000 pages of EU legislation, which gets, as we call it, harmonized. In other words, countries gradually take this on board. Uh, the vehicle for this are 35 negotiating chapters, which countries go one by one. So just to give you an example, current candidate Serbia and Montenegro are somewhere between chapter one and eight, and so on and so forth. This is, of course, normal business, and we are not right now in normal business. Scholarship done around the historic applications from Central and Eastern European countries, which already uh, were mentioned, to join the European Union, has taught us that these countries, uh, I'm originally born in Bulgaria, uh, and uh, uh, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, the Baltic states, were initially considered only for association membership with the European Union. In fact, this was, preferred, uh, this was considered to be the EU's preferred option, trade, but not absorption of the post-communist states, which were considered both too poor, uh, too administratively uh, incapable to apply the legislation of the EU, and there were a number of other issues. The European Union changed its mind. Partly its mind was changed by the leaders of Central and Eastern European countries at the time, who appealed to the leaders of France and Germany, to the leaders of the EU at the time, with something we call the literature rhetorical action. So they were not simply appeals, we want to join the EU, but they appealed to the EU's values, to democracy, to wanting to be in democratic countries as part of the EU. And the words they mentioned very often were their civilizational choice. This is exactly the same words that Ukraine is using. They're saying we want to be oriented towards the EU. And Ukraine's attempt and work to be closer to the EU has been as much about civilization of choice about NATO. We shouldn't make this to be only about NATO. This is the first point I wanted to share with you. The second one is, based on this, based on the fact that narrative and understanding and the way we talk about potential Ukrainian membership in the EU is changing, shifting by the statement of Ursula von der Leyen and the European Commission by the statements in the European Parliament, much is possible. It is possible for the European Union for a relatively short time to recognize Ukraine as a candidate, as an official candidate for EU membership. I don't think it will help particularly Ukraine's war effort, but it will certainly help Ukrainians to be supported with something they have desired for a long time. The procedure for recognizing Ukraine as a candidate for your membership involves a commission opinion, which in the best of circumstances usually takes a year to produce, maybe the commission can produce it in three months, on Ukrainians' readiness to start negotiations. Again, we're talking about processes which are technical and take time, but mobilization is possible. And it involves, more importantly, a unanimous vote in the Council of Ministers of the European Union. Council of Ministers of the European Union uh, votes with unanimity on issues related to enlargement and on most 99% of issues related to foreign policy. 
this has been often seen as the use weakness, as the use softness, as the use slowness, because it's sufficient to have one member state as a veto player, as we call it in theory, for any decision not to be taken. However, we have seen that the European Union has been maintaining and renewing sanctions with unanimity since 2014, since the annexation of the Crimea, towards Russia every six months without a single member state objecting. This is one of the evidence, one of something which has been taken as an evidence that the EU can be united. And the sanctions of the last weeks have gone very fast. They've gone with lightning speed for normal EU decision making. What this means is that these unanimous decisions on Ukrainian candidacy are possible. The obstacles in as much as this will help Ukraine, the obstacles to, to this happening um, are also to be found in this country, in the Netherlands. It's not because the Dutch people don't want to support Ukraine today, but because in 2016, there was a consultative referendum on Ukraine's association agreement with the European Union that took place in the Netherlands that with very, very small margin got the threshold of being officially accepted and that voted against the ratification of the association agreement of Ukraine with the European Union, which by that time had been negotiated and signed also by the Dutch government, but not ratified. The dynamics behind this referendum are complex. There is good scholarship from Dutch scholars, especially a report from colleagues in Nijmegen, who pointed out a number of different dynamics there, partly uh, initiated by the initiative takers of the referendum partly people's concerns about Ukraine becoming a new member. Because of those concerns, the Dutch government somewhat later took up the provisions and the, con the context of the association agreement and negotiated with the other EU member states a special decision which is appended to the treaty. It's not an official addendum. The lawyers would have a very good explanation what it is, but it's a unique constitutional document that, that essentially confirms what the association agreement says this association agreement does not give Ukraine a European perspective. In other words, the Dutch government, in order to get the agreement ratified through parliament, put an extra decision through the EU, uh, which said, this does not mean Ukraine has the perspective to join the EU. Now, I dare say the Dutch public opinion might be changing its mind these days, but we don't know yet, we don't have the research. But what this means is, that one of the veto players on potential fast recognition of the Netherlands, of, of Ukraine as a new candidate member is in the Netherlands. Not necessarily the Dutch government, I think the Dutch government might be quite amenable to things changing, but public opinion will play a role. So all of us who are the citizens who participate in public opinion, we maybe want to be involved in that decision. Now, Last but not least, there's many other things to say about the EU, the EU's unique decision to use the European Peace Facility to fund military equipment and so on. Many things are moving. They may not be moving fast enough now for Ukraine, but they're moving faster than the EU has ever moved. The last point um, is a personal one. I indeed come from Bulgaria. I've studied EU enlargement for many, many years. Today happens to be Bulgaria's national holiday, the 3rd of March which celebrates the treaty concluded at the end of the Russian-Turkish War for Bulgaria's independence, which has always been a, a very big claim by Russia on uh, sort of Bulgarian history. In that particular war, this, there's a lot of debate today in Bulgarian and among Bulgarian intellectuals. In that particular war, there were also Ukrainians, Finns, and others who fought on the side of Bulgaria for independence and they're being recognized as well today. But more importantly, Bulgaria made its choice to become an EU and NATO member in a period in which it could, based on its democratic politics, just like the Ukrainians want to do today. And for anyone who says there were areas that were in Russia's sphere of influence, I would like to say history is important, but what we said in Central and Eastern Europe then, and I think we should all remember, history is not destiny. We should all allow the citizens of Ukraine to take the choice for their country to take a direction in foreign policy 
and in domestic governance that they want to take. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antoinette. On that final point, we know, of course, that there are also realist thinkers in IR who think otherwise, who think that is a prerogative of great powers to control their immediate external environment, to have a, a sphere of influence, that it was a cardinal mistake for NATO uh, to uh, send out invitations uh, back in, in 2008. And the same, it could be seen as a huge mistake uh, by Ursula von der Leyen uh, to make a very quick statement that, well, Ukraine should now very quickly join. In other words, is that question about membership, EU membership of Ukraine not only going to be decided by intricate procedures and that few people understand on our side of the divide, but also by a great power like, like Russia? Yeah, very yeah, brief, I, please. I think also this is a question that, that, that would need to have a very long answer. But perhaps uh, the short answer to this is that if we accept that, I don't know what we've been, so that this, is, these are, this is an outlook that allows us to understand the analysis that Putin might have been making. So as scholars, we should understand that his view of the world of balance of great powers and so on is not necessarily the European Union's view. The European Union has been shifting. It has been recognizing the need to have hard power. But the European Union continues to recognize every country's right not to be part of somebody's sphere of influence. So in the normative sphere, I think we should reject that analysis and we should say the future will be what we make it. In the sphere of understanding how people think, we should bear this view in mind because it's a real view which a lot of, not only a lot of, Putin's closest unto Russia sharing, but also a lot of people in Russia have had the chance to discuss with students from St. Petersburg International Relations, colleagues, and so on. This is a real view. It exists. It's up to us to decide whether it will prevail. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was also meant as a provocation because some people argue and come into the debate, this debate with arguments like, well, the United States would not really accept a Chinese military alliance with Mexico and Canada, right? Uh, so there are different, different ways uh, of, of, uh, of looking at this. I'd like to open up uh, uh, for the, uh, the Q&A and uh, uh, please conclude that I've, I'm a lousy moderator and chair so far uh, because you have less time than I, I promised. Uh, um, so um, I'm welcoming any questions from the audience and, and also I keep an eye on what's happening online where we have more people actually than, than in this room. Uh, could you please, if you have a question, or if you want to make a comment, if it's a question, only one question. Uh, if it's a comment, please keep the comment brief, and could you start by introducing yourself? And there are, as you can see, people in the room to help you with the microphones. So gentlemen, uh, uh, over there, you go first. Please wait until you have the mic. <clears throat> and could you say to whom on the panel you are addressing the question? That would help us as well. Uh, mainly to the Ukrainians. Okay. Uh, my name is George. I'm a student in Leiden University and uh, I'm studying chemistry, energy and sustainability. Uh, first of all, it's impressive that you uh, show something that is black and white. And I think most of us know that the things are gray. Uh, I, don't, I didn't see any self-criticism about the role of the European Union in this war and um, about the responsibilities of the Ukrainians, right? Um, the first question, it, it's, 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 one, it's one question, but for two subjects. The first question is, uh, what do you have to say to the European Union when they were supporting the neo-Nazi party of Svoboda in 2014? Um, and um, the other thing is about why the President Zelensky wants to make Ukraine a member of NATO with his actions in 2020, making the Ukraine um, uh, an enemy of its neighbor. And okay. we all know that Thank NATO you. is an object of the United States, and we all know the role of the United States with the rivalry with Russia in, in, to uh, become superior in, in certain areas. 
Okay, thank you. thank you very much. I will give Veronica, a question was clearly for Veronica, and the privilege of answering only one of the two questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for, for your question. I am uh, slightly puzzled by uh, what neo-Nazi parties are, are in Ukraine. Um, so I'm not really sure what you're referring to because that, to my knowledge, does not exist. Uh, I will address uh, why our President Zelensky uh, has decided to, to join or who wants to join NATO and um, come closer to the European Union. Uh, it's mainly because we are fond of our pro-European values and we want to come closer to, to those values. We, we have seen a shift ever since the, the Soviet Union has collapsed and especially after the Orange Revolution in 2004 that we value our freedom, our democracy uh, and those values prevail over anything else. The fact that our neighbor unfortunately does not agree uh, has nothing to do with Ukraine and, and our, our opinion of it. Um, we are just, I guess, unfortunate of our geographical location in that sense. Um, and for Zelensky, um, I think he has, well, he's, he's one brave man, uh, I can say that, um, but also because he needs the support of NATO and the EU. Don't forget that the EU is also a crucial factor uh, here and has been a very, very good ally, um, has shown a lot of support for Zelensky to tackle the aggression towards Ukraine coming from Russia. Um, and we do that, the, the, the want and need to come closer and closer to NATO and the EU is predominantly because of the aggression and the occupation and the, the annexation of Crimea. Um, that, that, that is... Thank well. you very much. Victoria, I see one more hand raised. A gentleman uh, right there in front. Please introduce yourself. And tell us whom you're addressing on the panel. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you all for, for your words here. My name is Victor Contreras. I'm a lawyer and LLM student from Chile. And my question, I guess it's for Professor Defrimova, uh, given that you're more familiar with the topic, of course. Uh, having words with people back, back home, back in Chile, we are, of course, very far from Europe and very far from Ukraine specifically. And uh, there's a lot of, of course, we all know misinformation and people that maybe deliberately believe the Putin speech uh, of uh, the Nazi party, so on, so on. And some of them, as I said, like maybe uh, because of ideology, some others maybe because of ignorance, uh, because we're, again, very far, right? <coughs> and uh, so I wanted to know how was the landscape of, the political landscape of Ukraine before this, and maybe, I don't know, since 2014 to now, Zelensky, what does he stand for? What does he represent? Uh, what are the parties moving there? So, so some information basically to answer to those uh, allegations on the other side. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for your, your question. It's, it's a very good question to, to ask and to think about. Um, I think the, the starting point to answer this question would have to be uh, the, the fact that Yanukovych, back in 2014, refused to sign the EU-Ukraine uh, Association Agreement. Um, with that came a lot of protest, and that's where we saw the Euromaidan and people coming on the streets and, unfortunately, people being shot in the city center of Kyiv. Um, after that, we had uh, Poroshenko come uh, to power, and his government was very much uh, European um, forward-minded. Uh, he valued, uh, and he was the one that, that signed then the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement, and that's how the cooperation began. So it is 
very much, and, and uh, Zelensky took over from him um, with the same kind of values and ideologies in mind. Unfortunately for both Poroshenko and probably even more so for Zelensky, you, had, you have a very um, big focus on military and on defense uh, as well. So I would say that the political landscape ever since the 2014 is very much um, flourishing democracy. Um, there's a lot of reforms happening um, because ever since the signing of the association agreement, Ukraine is taking uh, more and more steps towards, um, well, the EU standard, let's say. Um, and so I understand that there's a lot of misinformation um, that, well, pro-Russian, let's say, don't understand what we're doing and calling it neo-Nazis. Um, Zelensky has also been called a drug addict, but it's very much just the, the want and the desire to become democratic, transparent, to get rid of the oligarchy and the corruption that, that did happen in, in Ukraine uh, before, and um, that's the progression that it takes based on, on um, cooperation with the EU. Okay. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, the question was also addressed to Antoinette. No, I don't think so, but I just want to help Veronica a little bit. So Ukraine's uh, political party spectrum and, and generally political party scene has been very, very lively. Um, first of all, of course, we have to bear in mind that Ukraine is a presidential republic. So presidents have been much more in our, uh, let's say, uh, view than uh, you would have in a parliamentary republic. There has been a number of parties directly associated or linked to the presidents <laughs> mentioned. Um, let's uh, also give it a moment for political pluralism. So after, indeed, the Euromaidan, which Veronica mentioned, there has been a reformist movement with young people, civil society, that got into the Ukrainian parliament in the Rada. Then, in addition to this, uh, during the latest presidential elections, uh, Zelensky came out of nowhere. He was considered the populist candidate, given his uh, past as a TV talk show host. And not only that, but of course, he played a president. He played a teacher playing a president. God, this is really, yeah. But uh, he's been a leader since then, which is important. But Zelensky's party, Servant of the People, ran on a platform which had to do with reforms. So in some cases, even quite extreme. It wasn't particularly about geopolitics. In fact, when he ran, people were, because he said he wanted to negotiate to resolve the conflict in the east of Ukraine, people considered him soft. They thought, oh, he's going to sell out Ukraine. Poroshenko was more, let's say, military oriented. So Zelensky's uh, current position is a direct evolution and result of what he experienced since he's been President, I mean, Zelensky ran on things such as the state in your smartphone, as uh, we have been told, uh, public administration reform, things which the EU has been actually busy with since the association agreement uh, has been in force. So things which also our research shows are very crucial to Ukrainians. You know, how do you get your administration to work better? Um, reform of services, all kinds of things which all of us here are busy with if you're in a country which is not at war. So I just also want to stress that a lot of Ukrainian politics has not really been, not everything in Ukrainian politics has been, as also Norat and my research has shown, about geopolitical orientations. A lot of Ukrainian politics has been about reform, about improving the administration, about young people being able to enter the administration. Some of those interviews for civil servants were taking place on YouTube to increase transparency. That was part of, you know, that, that's the kind of reforms we're talking about. Doesn't mean everything is perfect. A lot of political parties are still associated with oligarchs, funded by oligarchs, but that's, that's not the point. Thank you very much, Antoinette. Um, I would like to also involve the, uh, the audience at, at home, uh, over well over 300 uh, people. And I have, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone because there is a question from a colleague uh, from political science, uh, Jona schulhofer Wohl, And that, I think, is a good question for Isabella. It's a very short one. What exactly, says Jona, are Putin's security concerns when it comes to the Ukraine? <laughs> Um, thank you, Jona, for your question. Uh, it is a deceivingly short question, which I can elaborate on. I'm going to try and keep it short as well. So the security concerns uh, relate uh, uh, importantly to the fact
that um, uh, the NATO alliance has um, uh, extended and extended over the course of time since the dissolution of the Soviet Union to, um, in the perception of Russia, almost reach its own borders. So they feel that there is a direct threat um, by the presence of NATO, think about the Baltic states in particular, uh, being present right there where it touches at the heart of, uh, of Russia. Moreover, um, over the uh, past decades, uh, NATO um, has worked on a anti-missile system uh, that um, had a main logic um, to protect NATO territory, uh, very much uh, agency by the United States, from rogue states in the international system that commanded long-range missiles that could touch the alliance territory. Um, whereas the rogue states, of course, would be potentially North Korea and Iran, Russia felt, uh, feels, that it's very much focused on their country. And these anti-missile systems are quite close to the borders in the south and also um, touching um, uh, the eastern flank of NATO. So that is perceived as a very pressing um, security concern which they want to see addressed. Thank you very much. I think it's a short answer. Happy to elaborate, Jonah, if you uh, that's, need that's more. <laughs> that's perfect. We're not going to involve Jonah online in the conversation. <laughs> so I'm looking at the audience. There you go. Please introduce yourself uh, and wait for the microphone. Yeah, it's over here. All right, uh, thank you very much. My name is Alina, I'm a PhD candidate uh, here at Leiden University. Um, I'm originally from Russia, and I wanted to make three brief points. Uh, it's more of a comment rather than a question. So the first point, uh, I know that for many people who didn't follow Russian politics for the past years, it was a surprise what happened in the international politics, what was the decision of Putin. And I think it's very important to not really uh, separate internal politics from the foreign politics in that regard because things that were happening inside the country were quite symptomatic of what kind of power this is, what kind of regime it is. And uh, many people on the basis of all these developments for the past years made a conscious decision to leave, to bring their family out of the country and all the different things that we try to do. Then the second point is, uh, a lot of my friends from Ukraine, and I do have family in Ukraine as well, um, now appeal to the Russian people saying, why are you keeping quiet and why are you not going out uh, protesting, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's very important to remember that all these years that happened, there was such a crackdown on social society, on the society, on the civil society, on the coordinated opposition, on media. These are all very important things, and these are all very important risks that people have to face if they want to go outside on the street. But nevertheless, the third point that I wanted to make is that maybe I'm privileged, maybe I'm surrounded by good people, good friends who are articulated and who are using the information that is available, but I know that I am standing with Ukraine, I know that people from Russia stand with Ukraine, and I hope that more of these voices are going to be heard and that the situation will be resolved. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. You get a good round of applause here. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Hi, thank you. Um, this is a question directed to Professors Olsinga and Dimitrova, although I, I don't know if Professor uh, Olsinga will be rejoining us. Um, so it has both a military aspect and a European aspect, which is, uh, in light of the recent evasion, uh, invasion, Emmanuel Macron has renewed his call for a European army. How feasible do you think the creation of such an army or defense union is in the medium term, especially in light of most EU states' current NATO commitments? Yeah, that's... Uh, uh... I think indeed uh, France uh, uh, is uh, more competent to answer that, but based on the course which I've just taught in the Global Affairs minor in this campus, I think uh, we can say that uh, the EU has been taking uh, quite far-reaching steps to include, to increase its strategic awareness. It has uh, been finalizing a document which is called the Strategic Compass. It's coming out uh, and 
actually in March this year. Um, it has a global strategy 2016, and a lot of this is talking about can we actually increase the military capacities and capabilities. There's a lot of uh, obstacles. Uh, some of them have to do with uh, lack of desire of countries to fund up to and above the 2% of GDP for defense, which, as Franz already mentioned, is something that is changing now. Uh, there is a question of joint commitment of forces to UN NATO. Are these the same forces? So this, this will be a question in, in the near future. In general, the EU's debate about whether they should rely on NATO uh, in terms of military power is very vigorous at the moment and ongoing. So uh, it might be, I think, the realistic answer, and maybe Isabel also has something uh, to say about that, it's more feasible than it was a month ago, but it's still a medium-term prospect. Yeah, I completely share your assessment. It's been a very, very complicated discussion in the past few years, indeed because of the uh, overlapping, rivaling um, uh, claims and competencies with NATO. Uh, so that has been the, the complicating factor, but it also has to do with political will. So does the EU, do the Europeans see themselves as commanding military force in the name of the EU? And it was quite easy to rely on the United States until uh, the US elected a president that started to raise doubts about the reliability, the tenability of its commitment uh, towards NATO. And then there was another perspective on this whole discussion to what extent a, a NATO uh, force would be desirable. Um, but I expect, just like Antoinette, that this discussion is going to be conducted in a, from a completely different angle now. Um, so uh, we'll wait and see. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, hey, so my name is Peter. I'm studying also at Leiden University uh, in international relations. And my question is uh, regarding the EU accession of Ukraine or this kind of promise that has been made to them. And I think it's to Professor Dimitrova mostly. So. Do you think this sends a confusing message to the other EU candidate countries, to, to Serbia or, or even to the other uh, Western Balkan countries like Bosnia-Herzegovina that uh, have been left without this kind of promise um, and that also have conflictuous relationship with their neighbors? Um, yeah, do you think this is uh, confusing or just uh, or it's just a change of facts that made the EU now change its uh, strategy? And do you think this is also going to be changed towards the Western Balkan countries? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm very happy you asked this question because uh, the answer is there has been a promise to the Western Balkan candidate states, which are official candidates, and this promise was made by the European Council decision in Thessaloniki in 2003. So these countries have gone through a number of those stages, and here I'm talking about the official candidates, Serbia and Montenegro. Then we have North Macedonia and Albania who are on the verge of starting negotiations, are official candidates, so they're both much further. And in terms of the magic words, European perspective, this was given by the European Council in 2003. The situation in uh, the candidate and aspirant, country, aspirant uh, EU members in the Western Balkans is complicated by the fact that the EU always does progress of membership in exchange for reforms. In the case of Serbia and Montenegro, they are stuck not because the EU doesn't want to move them further. They do have the promise that if they do the reforms the EU requires, part of it is which adapting to EU legislation, but also things having to do with democracy, rule of law, media, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that they can move faster to EU membership. So in fact, Serbia and Montenegro are the living proof that the EU will allow you to join if you reform further. Why Serbia is not reforming further is really the subject of another roundtable. Now, um, I think is uh, what has been said in the last few days sending a, a, a confused signal to the Western Balkans. What has been said in the last few days is not an official candidacy acceptance by the EU. These are words. This is uh, a discourse which is changing. It's important that this discourse is changing, but as I said, for Ukraine to become even an official candidate, uh, all kinds of uh, official decision-making steps have to be taken, which are not taken in the case of Ukraine, but they have been taken in the case of the Western Balkans. Um, 
I am anyone in the Western Balkans who has been uh, participating in this process will not be confused. As for the broad public, it depends, of course, what the Serbian authorities who have been very ambivalent about this war will be decide to tell to the public, but I think this is also a separate question. Okay. Thank you. Then there is four rows down, lady, um, over there. Uh, I think this question mostly goes to uh, Professor Dimitrova again, but if anyone else has opinions, of course, uh, feel free to answer as well. Uh, my question is, have some of these sanctions gone too fast? Has the EU made those decisions too quickly, um, especially looking at the banning of Russian media and other choices in the EU, this, the, 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 and specifically sanctions made this week? I'm sorry, could you elaborate yeah. this a little bit? Which ones of the sanctions from the EU have gone too fast? Uh, well, my question is, have sanctions that have been made by the EU, have they been made too fast or have they been made in an, an, an appropriate time yeah. frame? Okay, yes. Uh, they have gone faster than most of you decision making. Uh, they have not been too fast in the sense that the EU doesn't know what it's doing. So. Uh, the EU has been building up its, its sanctions policy uh, for, again, for more than the last 10 years. And it has been changing in the sense that sanctions in the older, shall we say, mode were sanctions about countries as a whole, which the EU and other international actors have recognized is not a very good thing. So nowadays, sanctions are more about individuals and entities. New sanctions in 2014 addressed individuals and entities involved in the annexation of Crimea or companies funding various economic activities in the Crimea. The EU sanctions now in the last week, which are about three to four packages, I'm almost losing track, were a, a, a sort of a graduation of, of sanctions taken. So they started last week with sanctioning members of the Russian parliament, the Duma, uh, with respect to the recognition of the separatist entities of Lugansk and Donetsk. They continued with uh, sanctions of individuals as well, which is something the EU has been doing more and more. And now the EU, of course, was talking about the SWIFT system, financial system, and so on and so forth. The unanimity on SWIFT changed in a day. That's fast. But given that everybody knew that it was on the cards, it's not that it's not thought through. With this, I mean that Germany was initially reported not to be in favor, Italy, etc. Uh, no, they're not taken too fast in the sense that they're not thought through or that something, you know, is not being, and there is still scope for sanctions related to, for example, Russian money in Europe, Dutch companies which are based in the Netherlands that facilitate uh, various channels of Russian uh, money coming and going through Europe and so on and so forth. This is another big debate, which I think we've been having also in Dutch media. Uh, to what extent can we make those democratic countries that we have resilient if we are allowing huge amount of uncontrolled finances to affect politics in Europe? And this debate will continue. Can I just add something about the effectiveness of sanctions? Because we operate in the belief that when we institute sanctions, that they will lead to a change in behavior. And based on the current state of academic research, that is quite an illusion. So sanctions are very, very powerful as a signaling instrument in international affairs. You signal your displeasure with certain choices that are being made. But in terms of having expectations that the enforcement of sanctions will lead to a change in behavior of the target is very unlikely. So there is an, uh, a very authoritative IFO study, uh, a German think tank, and there is a very, very low percentage of actually uh, target change uh, behavior. Um, so we should not harbor any elaborate expectations that this is going to be um, the silver bullet, uh, pun intended, uh, to, to solve this, definitely not. Um, sanctions are a very rough instrument and they tend to hurt the general population first and more compared to those that you want to target who are in charge of the decision-making procedure. So we should start thinking about enlarging the panoply of instruments that we can potentially develop in order to, to target that change in behavior. 
Cuba has been a subject of uh, sanctions from the United States for 60 years. No change in the course of action that they set out with from 1959 onwards. So. Uh -huh. Right, good, good point. Uh, referring to the findings of that literature, Iran has also been cut off from, from SWIFT. Still, one is wondering whether the, those research findings also reflect on what we see being rolled out right now uh, towards Russia, which is, of course, quite, quite phenomenal. Um, if, uh, but, but don't forget, if I may, that sanctioning individuals, uh, funders of the Putin regime, is not exactly the, the kind of sanction we're talking about in that literature. And we do have some evidence in the newer literature that sanctions, I mean, sanctioning political supporters and financial supporters of specific actions is actually now much more positively seen in the literature or something because if we are waiting for some people around Putin to change his mind, then you have to sanction somebody who is participating in support of the regime. So I think this is a completely different tool, but there were people wanting yes. to speak. So no, the, it's good to have this discussion to see that there are interesting findings, but the, to an extent, the conclusion is also the jury is still out uh, on what we see, uh, what's happening right now. And there are many hands uh, and uh, there is little time. So I would like to ask people who have a question on the cultural side of things also uh, to give a preference. Yes, lady in the middle. Yeah, I'm glad I asked this question. Yeah, you know, with the mic, please. Mm. That one word. How am I going to get there? <laughs> yeah. Be careful with this. <laughs> this gives you a lot of power. You still have to be brief yeah, with that mic in your hand. Uh, okay, it's mostly for Professor Bolle, because I saw today that uh, in uh, Italian universities, they stopped uh, reading and banned uh, Dostoevsky's books. Do you think it's gonna, uh, the whole sanction and ostracism would uh, have influence on the future with scholars and just the knowledge about the literature from Russia? Well, I would say that more money for research will be redirected from the Middle East to Russia, to Russian studies. So. I'm quite positive about the future of my uh, field of research. Um, and I, I know what you're referring to. I think that is preposterous. It, it's a spontaneous decision that um, only serves the purpose of alienating Russia, Russian culture. That's, that's not the way to go ahead, obviously. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I see we're really warming up now. There's so many hands going up. Uh, um, yeah, there you go. Please introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Guy Gripa. I'm a master's student of public administration. And I have a question for Dr. Masbus. So recently we saw a lot of international contests like Eurovision and the football international competition banning Russia. And I wanted to know what do you think are going to be the consequences of that? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I think I'm still formulating my idea about that. I think I am not done thinking through it, but from the kind of principles that um, you know, I've been talking about uh, also banning particular media channels, I think this might not be the best way to go because we are also isolating people once again and demonizing them, and these are not the people that necessarily need to be targeted. Um, I think, again, cutting off cultural ties, sports ties, right, our uh, coming together, it brings us back to the isolation that we have experienced also in the Cold War. And again, coming from behind the <laughs> Berlin Wall, um, this is not the way uh, that, that we will come closer to achieving some kind of consensus and peace building. So I, for now, I am very skeptical that this is the right decision. Um, but yeah, I can also see the, the sentiment to, to do that, right? Where it's coming from. And in the sports, of course, we have also the issue of uh, big uh, sponsors being actually the um, state companies of Russia. And this is again going back to the sanctions, right? Whom are we sanctioning now? Gazprom, for example. Um, and that is a, a whole different aspect as well as pretty much the, the scandals of exclusion of Russian sports um, participation 
because of doping scandals that have been there before. So there has been accumulation also of bad press in that, uh, that area of our social culture, cultural life. So I know where the sentiment is coming from. I am not sure whether this is the right way to go about it. Okay. Thank you, Onorata. I have a question involving also the online audience, which is bigger than uh, the number of people that we have in this room. Uh, a question uh, from Dan van Beers uh, that I'd like to paraphrase and direct to Isabella, and that is, he says, why do NATO countries communicate equipment they deliver to Ukraine? And I think there's two sides to that. One, I think Dan suggests this doesn't make any military sense. Uh, uh, to tell the world what, you, what kind of equipment you're delivering to Ukraine. And the second side to that question could be, is there actual, are there actually things going on that we don't see or hear? I am still processing the question. So he, yeah. the, the so, issue so is the, that we are in the public discourse, are finding out what kind of equipment is being delivered. States proudly say what they send to Ukraine. Uh, and okay. Dan says, well... Why do you say that in the first place? Because it should stay secret, that that's the implication. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, uh, there's a, a signaling um, element here. So um, NATO signals um, by making public what it is that the UK, uh, Ukrainians need by exposing that there have, is a lack in their uh, armament, um, that they're serious. So that this is a, a major issue uh, and we are committing uh, to um, uh, granting Ukraine the right to defend itself. That's a, a very important legal principle in international law. You can defend yourself. Um, why should it stay secret? Um, I have no doubt that there's also lots going on that we do not know about uh, that is taking place uh, behind uh, closed doors. Um, I, yeah, I have no doubt about it. You you're used the word signaling. Might it also be a signal to the domestic electorate, actually, that we're in. Of this course. is not just somebody else's war. Of course, there is a flood wave of sympathy for Ukraine, and um, that, of course, also plays into um, uh, raising the profile of NATO. There is an organization that caters for the security needs, and indeed, we are doing something, or we're trying to do something. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you allow me, uh, uh, we are going to run no more than 10 minutes over time. Uh, lady over there, the microphone is coming in your direction. I don't know who it is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, um, my name is Sanjana. I'm an exchange student um, from the UK. Um, I was just wondering about the context of um, refugees. So I guess this question may be um, directed to Professor Dimitrova. Um, um, Ukrainian refugees have been welcomed with open arms in neighbouring Eastern European countries, which has been really good to see. However, I know a lot of um, existing refugee communities from the Middle East and North Africa have seen this warm reception, and it's starkly contrast to the kind of layers of discrimination that they faced when they came to Europe from other conflicts. And I was just wondering, in that context, how do you think this conflict might change the response and approach to refugees in the EU and the Dublin regulation, especially given that this was such a crisis to the EU back in 2014, 2015? Yes, I think uh, the European Commission had already prepared the migration pact that is trying to fix the incredible mess that uh, Dublin uh, 1 and 2 have been in terms of the EU actually uh, getting its act together on migration. Uh, the Commission has been trying to push this uh, particular uh, um, instrument and to create much stronger uh, solidarity among EU member states. I think these uh, views that we have seen now and from Poland hopefully will contribute to this solidarity. And I think anything that, that nowadays is raising the profile for, for refugees is helpful. Um, so I, I have hoped that this will bring European Union member states closer together in terms of very specific legal arrangements that will upgrade the EU's uh, migration policy, which has been a mess. But maybe I, I know that my colleague over there had a question about that or a point. Uh, so maybe, Jan, we can connect the question by giving the floor to uh, Matthew Hoy. Matt, please go ahead. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. It's much of a question to the institution as it is to the panel and to uh, the students, and it responds to the Rector Magnificus's point at the start that we have, a com as a community, um, have uh, something um, that we should uh, do here ourselves. Uh, we have a responsibility to act. Um, as the last student noted, there are going to be many uh, migrants, many refugees coming our way very soon, and not just Ukrainian. There's going to be a lot of Russian refugees coming this way as well, and there are already a lot of Afghan refugees coming from a totally different conflict. So the question is, what are we as a university going to do? And what I am grateful for the opportunity to speak here, and why I'm grateful is that I believe um, we have to act. I believe we have to set up a university in exile, um, and we have to prepare the university to give educations for all of the student-aged refugees who are going to have to continue their educations or going to have to start their educations. Um, I think this is an imperative for many reasons, um, but it's also something we don't have much of a choice upon. Um, whether you think this is an act of goodwill, an act of charity, an act of humanitarian um, uh, expression for the refugees, um, no matter how you want to cut this, it doesn't quite matter because we're going to have to deal with this sooner than later. There will be people coming to the Netherlands who will need educations, and this is uh, where they were going to come among many other European, many other Dutch institutions. So that is why I'm calling on the university, again, to set up a university in exile. We have to get ahead of this problem because the problem, the challenge, I should say, um, is coming our way anyways. This is a big ask. It's a short-term and it's a long-term ask. In the short term, um, we have to deal with the questions and the challenges as they appear. Um, but as everyone here at this institution knows, um, providing an education is an institutional question and it's a long-term question. So we have to talk about how we can create institutions, procedures, mechanisms, classes, forums, etc. everything we can do in order to house and provide educations for the refugees and asylum seekers who are coming our way. This is, again, a big ask. Um, so it can't be done just on the work of charity and the work of goodwill. It's gonna require that the institution um, provide um, means and support for doing this. There are many challenges at stake. I'm happy to uh, talk about some of these challenges if we have a minute. Um, and there are many other people who should be involved. I've talked to a few of my colleagues and a few other people, um, and a common response here is to say, yes, this is a good idea, um, but this is properly a national question where the national universities need to all respond um, at once. I agree, um, but someone has to take the lead here. I believe Leiden University should take the lead, and we should set the standard for other institutions on how to respond to what is going to be a crisis um, once again. Again, there's lots to do. There are endless challenges that um, come our way, um, but why I'm here and what I wanted to say is that we should do this. Um, and so I welcome your support. My last name is Hoy, H-O-Y-E. I'm a professor here at the Institute for Security and Global Affairs, um, and I'm happy to uh, field your emails and help contribute. But what I would most like you to do is to start pushing this up the line. Tell your teachers that this is something that has to be done and get them to push this up the line as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, um, Matt. Uh, um, good thinking. Many, many sectors in society ask, what does this mean for us? And then the next question is, how about our counterparts in the, in the affected uh, uh, countries? And there is definitely, um, I really applaud your, your initiative. Uh, also, the, I understand the common sense reaction, while well, this is too big for Leiden only, right? Uh, but you have to start to get the ball rolling. Uh, Matt will be downstairs uh, also to continue that conversation. Uh, all of us will be downstairs in a few moments. Uh, to continue conversations with you uh, that uh, things you would like to talk about. And I've been told there are also B 
beach flag stands downstairs where both staff and students uh, can talk for uh, to university people to share their concerns, their fears, their insecurity on all of these issues that are really, uh, that we're engulfed by uh, all of us. So uh, as you have realized, there were still so many hands uh, and that, I, that people who, who um, uh, would like to con continue the conversation, there is an end to these sessions. But uh, there is another one uh, 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 tomorrow, and there will be uh, more of these sessions. And having this conversation, we all agree, is, is very important. Uh, we cannot paralyze all our classes by talking about Ukraine only. So uh, let's use all of those extracurricular opportunities that we have, where I would like to make the point again, it's also very important to hear your voice. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you.